joining us. Yeah. I'm here to introduce Dr. Christina Diaz. She's an assistant professor of sociology and she's new to Rice and she came this year from the University of Arizona. Her PhD in sociology uh, is with a concentration in demography is from the University of Wisconsin and she won the 2014 graduate student paper award from the American Sociolo Sociological Association and her 2017 article with Jeremy E. Feel entitled The Effects of Teen Pregnancy, Reconciling Theory, Methods, and Findings won the Reuben Hill Award from the National Council on Family Relations. In 2018, she received a Career Enhancement Fellowship from the Woodrow Wilson National Foundation. Her research and teaching focus mainly on matters of immigration, family formation, and demography, and how they affect our culture. And uh, according to her Twitter feed, Professor Diaz is a parent of at least two cats, <laughs> likes to jog along Buffalo Bayou, and is searching for the best Mexican restaurants, something I will join you in. <laughs> and we hope that after her talk today, we will just know what the salmon bias is. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I have a couple of slides, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you and um, hopefully. Uh, can you see things all right on your end? OK, perfect. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming to uh, this Monday afternoon session. I am really thrilled I get to share my work uh, with this fabulous group of people, especially being a new Rice faculty member. It means a lot to me. So this presentation is actually based on a series of uh, completed and ongoing projects that seek to examine um, health and well being among Hispanic populations. And um, I know there's sort of a lot to manage and going on, but I'm happy to take questions as you have them. I mean, I don't know what the typical format is, but I'm happy to have more of a sort of dialogue um, scenario. So just before I jump into the talk itself, I wanted to provide an outline of what I'll be doing today. Just to make sure we are all on the same page, I'm gonna show some basic demographic data on the Hispanic population in the US. And then I'm gonna go ahead and describe some patterns in Hispanic health and discuss existing theories that try to explain some of these patterns. And based on the title of my talk, um, you might guess that Hispanic immigrants are actually exceptionally healthy. And so what I'm gonna do is focus on explanations that try to really account for this health advantage and when I do this, I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about some of my own work that tests how well these explanations hold up in the real world. Um, and then I'm just gonna conclude with some additional thoughts and policy implications based on my findings today. And again, if you have questions, if you need me to slow down or if something isn't clear, I'm happy to address that. All right. So as of 2019, there were around 324 million people living in the United States. And recent census estimates suggest that the Asian population was about 17.7 .7 million. And Asians are also the fastest growing population in the United States. If we look over to the Hispanic population, though, we see that this is a pretty substantively large group, right? Hispanics are hovering around 58.5 million persons. And, you know, we could see over the past sort of 10 year period, Hispanics have also increased in number as well. But what's really important here, and a lot of people don't necessarily um, know this, is that a lot of this population growth in the Asian and Hispanic population is actually driven by births and not immigration. And this is a fairly recent phenomenon, I would say within the past 20 years or so. 
And so if we dig into the data a little further into the exact origins of the Hispanic population, it's perhaps not surprising to many of you that um, about 68% are Mexican origin. And if you were curious about what things look like in Houston, this number actually jumps to 71%. So even though we see you know, a pretty diverse populations from you know, South America, Central America, Cuban, and Puerto Rico, it, it's pretty clear here that Mexicans comprise the majority of the Hispanic origin population. So even though Hispanics are a rapidly growing population and they're pretty influential culturally and politically, Hispanics are also economically disadvantaged compared to other populations. So if we look again at the most recent census data, fewer than 17% of Hispanics actually have a bachelor's degree or higher. And Hispanics also report the lowest income per capita, or another way to think about this is per person income within a household at around $20,000. And if we were to actually separate this out by specific origins, uh, this picture gets a little more stark for uh, Mexican origin populations. So uh, fewer than 10% of Mexican origin adults living in the US have a bachelor's degree or higher. So, you know, we know that economic instability and poverty are really important indicators all by themselves, right? But um, it's also the case that there's a really strong link between economic status and health. So one of the things that consistently emerges in the literature is that people with higher levels of education and higher levels of income almost always report better health and fewer health conditions. And so I've just taken this graph, it's from a Centers of Disease Control report that just shows the probability somebody is in poor or fair health. And this is just separated out by different uh, populations. So we have white men and white women, black men, black women, and Hispanics as well. Here, I want to draw your attention to sort of the different colors shown in this graph. Um, darker colors mean somebody has a bachelor's degree or higher. And if we look at sort of the white bars, those indicate people who have less than a high school diploma. And so, you know, I just sort of want you to get sort of the visual sense of what's going on overall is that people with less education, regardless of which racial category or gender they are, they systematically report um, worse health. They're more likely to be in poor health. And, you know, this is a pattern that is really consistent across time, across place. There is one notable exception to this relationship though, and that is the Hispanic immigrant population. So one of the things that I personally think is really fascinating is that the Hispanic immigrant population um, and Mexicans in particular, or Mexican immigrants in particular, they actually have substantially better health than US born populations. So Hispanic immigrants are less likely to um, experience early death. They're less likely to smoke, use drugs or alcohol um, than US born populations. And they're also less likely to suffer for things like diabetes and heart disease. And you know, there's also some work that, you know, Hispanic immigrants also have a diet um, that is more rich in fresh fruits and vegetables as well. So the thing that I really want to point out here that has really puzzled scholars is that, you know, Hispanics have really good health outcomes and overall great health status, but 
they also have really low levels of education and they typically are um, pretty low income as well. So a lot of work and sort of theory building in population health and sociology are interested in, you know, given that people who are economically advantaged have better physical and mental health, how can we reconcile the fact that Hispanic immigrants are so healthy given that they have access to very few resources? So, so people say that this is sort of a, an unexpected paradox of population movement and immigration. So there are a number of explanations for this inconsistency. Um, some of these maybe um, hopefully you find fairly intuitive. I'm gonna walk through them, um, in particular the last two explanations. So the first explanation is that all of this is just a function of really bad data. So Hispanics only seem healthier compared to other populations because they're more likely to underreport symptoms. So one explanation could be that Hispanics um, and Hispanic immigrants in particular don't have access to regular medical care. And so they just sort of think they're healthier, but really they're suffering from undiagnosed conditions. The second explanation argues that there's something really unique about Hispanic culture that benefits their health. So some people argue that Hispanics might place a greater emphasis on the family and that this type of family support is gonna offer protection from poor health or sort of negative health behaviors. The final explanation, and I'll elaborate on each of these um, later, argues that this health advantage is the result of who migrates, basically. The argument is that immigrants are going to fundamentally differ in a variety of ways from people who choose or are unable to migrate and that it's this sort of selection or different um, population that creates this sort of health advantage. And I'm gonna talk again um, in detail about all of these, especially these last two explanations, um, familism and this idea of migration being a non-random process. And in my work, I'm able to sort of tease apart issues and concerns related to data by looking at um, what people call biomarkers, so measures of blood samples, urine samples, and saliva. So this gets around concerns about under reports or access or in, in um, migrants' inability to access medical care. Okay, so I'm gonna first unpack um, this first explanation a little more. And I'm just going to summarize some key findings from some of my co-authored work that tests whether familism might help explain the unexpectedly good health of Hispanic immigrants. So the idea of familism or family orientation is just rooted in this sort of belief system that centers around strong family ties, uh, financial, emotional, or social support towards the family members. And, you know, there is some work in Latin American studies, for instance, that argues Hispanics are much more likely to lean on family members for all types of support than persons from other racial or ethnic groups. So, you know, if this is the case, it could be that orientation towards the family, um, really high levels of familism could contribute to this immigrant health advantage, um, specifically by potentially offering protection from 
you know, their relatively poor um, economic status, for instance. Um, I'm going to add another layer of complexity here, and I'm really glad, um, I believe it was Tim brought this up earlier, is one of the really puzzling things about the health of Hispanics is that um, basically any advantage that we see among Hispanic immigrants disappears for their children. So children of immigrants typically have worse health than their parents, and they have higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, they have poor mental health. And so this is something that is really puzzling and I'll elaborate um, later on in the talk. But, you know, as a starting point, uh, some of my work examines and, and asks, okay, if family orientation is really responsible for driving this Hispanic health advantage, we should see that really high levels of family orientation should be associated with really good health, right? It should be associated with better health outcomes for Hispanic immigrants. And I've just created this graph, it's fictionalized just to help outline and, and let you all know how I'm thinking about this process. But because health also gets worse for children of immigrants um, who are the second generation or for those people who arrived to the US as children who we call the 1.5 generation, we should also see that the relationship between family orientation and health, it should sort of differ. It should look differ for immigrants and children of immigrants. And so to really test these hypotheses, I use a nationally representative data set of Hispanic populations. Uh, data are collected in 2008 and uh, between 2008 and 2011. And to avoid issues about data quality or under reports, we're able to capture um, blood samples and urine samples that look at levels of cholesterol current levels of inflammation, um, blood sugar, as well as um, body mass index. There are a lot of ways we could measure family orientation. Um, in this study, we rely on attitudes um, about family obligations. So, you know, this belief that you should help your family through financial difficulties beliefs towards family support, as well as beliefs around traditional family dynamics as well. Now, what I'm just going to show you really quickly are descriptive statistics. So these are going to be uh, average values or mean values by generational status. So this first generation are those immigrants who came to the United States as adults. The 1.5 generation are immigrants who came to the US as very young children. And the second generation are children of immigrants, but they were born in the United States. I've just highlighted some of these figures in red. Um, and the main thing I want to point out here is that feelings about depression and anxiety, um, as well as body actual measured body mass index, they increase across generations. So what this means is that basically either the longer people stay in the US or um, for those Hispanics who are born in the US, they actually are in worse health than immigrants. And this is something that has been established in the literature um, and, and, you know, our results sort of echo nicely with prior work. But um, not all health measures operate in a way that we would expect, and I'm happy to talk more about this during the Q&A. Um, 
the other thing I want to point out here is that if we look at our measures of family orientation, these values are actually really similar across generations. They're, they're pretty stable. We don't see much evidence that these decline um, the longer people spend in the US. And you know, for the sake of time, I don't want to throw a ton of information at you, um, but this graph really summarizes what we actually find in the data. We find no evidence that family orientation is linked to health. Instead of that really nice positive um, slope or line that I showed you for our hypothetical results, we, we don't see that. We see essentially no link between these two processes. Um, and we don't see any evidence that family orientation looks differently between immigrants and children of immigrants either. So for this reason, we feel actually pretty confident in saying that this explanation of family orientation is not sufficient. It's not convincing. Um, it's not a convincing explanation to really um, highlight and understand the immigrant health advantage. So we feel comfortable uh, kind of throwing this away uh, for now. Okay. Now, in our work, we've sort of eliminated one major explanation for why Hispanic immigrants are so healthy. Now we're going to assess the second possibility that immigrants are going to fundamentally differ from non-immigrant populations. And one of the interesting things about this explanation is that it can be broken down into two subsets of population movement. And this is um, a series of explanations that I get really excited about. So the overall evidence in the literature suggests that Hispanic or immigrant populations rather in general tend to be really motivated in some way. They tend to have higher levels of ability um, than non-migrants. So if we compare, um, for instance, Mexican immigrants living in the US with um, Mexicans who remain in Mexico and do not migrate, uh, immigrants typically have higher levels of education, higher levels of IQ than people who do not migrate. And, you know, if you think about just the migration process itself, you know, it requires a lot of investment. Immigration takes financial resources, it takes time. And, you know, depending on one's legal status, migration could also be pretty risky as well. And so people have thought that, you know, it's possible that immigrants are really a fundamentally different population than people who don't move at all. And the salmon bias and the healthy migrant hypothesis highlight the ways that migrants differ from other populations. So I'm gonna elaborate on these um, one at a time here. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of salmon bias. It's a little morbid, um, but it might give you a clue of what's going on. Um, just going to throw this out there. Um, what do salmon do that's really notable? Anyone want to chime in here? That they swim upstream to mate. Yeah, or and your eggs or something like that. Yeah, and then what happens? They after die right they, after they have their spawn. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. What this is, what this hypothesis is getting at. Um, so, according to this particular salmon bias hypothesis, some Hispanic immigrants who settle in the U.S. are going to become less healthy over time. And when they become less healthy, they're likely to return home, return back home. So this is salmon bias is a process of return migration for people or immigrants in particular who become unhealthy, 
And some people argue that this could be because these unhealthy immigrants are unable to seek good medical care in the US. So they might want to go back home to get fixed up and monitored or to reunite with family members um, who may or may not act as caregivers. And so the overall argument of salmon bias is that immigrants who remain in the US then are going to be a lot healthier. The unhealthy immigrants are leaving back home to Mexico. So it only looks like um, Hispanic immigrants are super healthy across the board, but that's only because data are not capturing those people who are going back home. So this is uh, the salmon bias. And, you know, I was actually pretty skeptical about this explanation when I first heard about it. Um, but I started looking a little into um, population movement between the US and Mexico, and I started to think, hmm, this explanation might actually hold some weight. So in the most recent period where data are available between 2013 and 18, about 710,000 Mexican immigrants returned back home to Mexico. So this many people left the US and went back home to Mexico. And at the same time, about 870,000 Mexican residents made the journey to the US. So there's a lot of population churning between the US and Mexico borders. And so because of this, I started thinking, well, you know, just looking at the size of you know, this return migration flow, it, you know, it certainly is possible that return migration of less healthy people is creating this illusion that Hispanic immigrants are in fact really healthy. Um, the interesting thing about the salmon bias hypothesis though, is that it really only focuses on voluntary return migration it doesn't really address how other types of return migration, like return migration due to deportation or forcible removers, uh, forcible removals rather, are impacting this dynamic. So one of the major contributions of my work is to examine how deportation changes the larger, aggregate health profile of Hispanic immigrants who stay in the US. So you now if we just think about deportation, right, there are these larger structural or government forces that are directly altering who is able to stay and who, who leaves, right? And so if we just eyeball the number of deportations or you know, we see how common it is on the news, you know, it's possible that deportation is actually changing, um, again, the, the health profiles at this like, larger aggregate level. All right, so um, based on all of this um, sort of literature and existing data, you know, me and my co-authors think, well, okay, if salmon bias was a real thing that was going on and responsible for the Hispanic health advantage, we should see people who are in worse health or who have a lot of chronic conditions should be the most likely to return back home uh, and, and return back to their home country. And so what I've done is just created, again, a stylized graph of what we might expect these patterns to look like. So we would expect um, if the um, y-axis was something like a probability of returning home, those in poor health, those in fair health should be much more likely to return than people who are in top-notch health. And so to test this um, hypothesis or sets of hypotheses, um, my co-authors and I combine different data, um, two different data sets to be specific. 
One is going to be representative of all Mexican immigrants living in the state of California. Our second data source actually samples respondents in the Tijuana airport, the central bus station in Tijuana, and we're able to get access to a deportation facility in Tijuana as well. Um, and, and this is a really unique and lovely data set because we're able to capture people who um, who return back to Mexico really the, the moment they cross the border. So this is really nice. And, you know, unfortunately, we don't have these data for all, you know, point major points of entry into Mexico. But this Tijuana region accounts for about 40% of the overall flows between US and Mexico. So we feel we feel pretty good about it. So we examine a variety of health measures, but we start by looking at self-reported health. And in the social sciences, this is considered a pretty reliable and accurate measure of overall well-being. Not surprisingly, people tend to be pretty um, good at telling you how they feel and what kind of health they're in. Uh, but we also look at other indicators um, other measures of health like diabetes, hypertension, health limitations. And we also have measures of mental health to approximate if people feel sad um, or stressed in their, at, at the time of the survey. Okay, so here are actual data. We are predicting the probability that someone returns to Mexico by these five categories of self-reported health. And first I'm showing you results for immigrants who are voluntarily returning home. So these are people who say, you know, I've just had it with the US, I I'm going back home and this is a individual decision. One of the things that's really shocking to us is this is the exact opposite of what we expected if that salmon bias hypothesis was occurring. People in better health have a significantly higher probability of return. So if we look at those who are in excellent health, they are much more likely to return to Mexico than those who are in poor health by about 18 percentage points. And we also see just this like gradation of return that decreases across each level of health. And again, this is not what we would expect if salmon bias was truly occurring. We look at deported migrants as well. So now we've added them in and these are the red bars and we pretty much see the same pattern as we have earlier. The one thing that really um, sort of shocked us is that if we look amongst those in fair or poor health, voluntary migrants um, in poorer health are much more likely to return than those who are deported. So what this would suggest is that um, the Hispanic health advantage that we see in the United States would actually be even more um, pronounced or it would be stronger if um, deportations were not occurring. And this is something I'll elaborate on later and provide some um, implications around. But again, these patterns are not consistent with salmon bias. We look at other health um, conditions. So amongst voluntary immigrants, those who um, experience pretty severe health limitations and stress are much more likely to return to Mexico than those who do not. And so this, these two particular findings are consistent with predictions made by salmon bias. But when we look at those with chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease, we actually find patterns again that are inconsistent. So this would, is not um, a consistent story with salmon bias. And the last 
um, result here that I'm going to show you is for deported populations. We see similar patterns. The one thing to note is that um, those who report feeling very stressed and a high degree of sadness have a significantly higher probability of um, being deported than those who do not have high levels of stress or sadness. But you know, we really think that because we're serving these folks in the de deportation facility, that that's sort of the main cause of, of these patterns here. Okay, so what can we say about salmon bias besides that this is a really sort of morbid term to use? We find mixed evidence for this. So we find that return migrants are more likely to report stress and pretty serious health limitations. But at the same time, they're less likely to report being in poor health themselves. They're less likely to have chronic conditions. So, you know, we did a lot of thinking about what could be going on here. And, you know, we suspect that return migration requires some baseline level of health, right? It takes money, it takes time and some likely you know, physical ability to return, especially if you're undocumented. And so you know, our, health, our measures of health limitations are those conditions that uh, prevent normal activity. So we think maybe return migration only occurs when you have conditions that really prevent your ability to work or sort of live fruitfully in the United States. So overall, we find pretty weak support for, for this particular hypothesis. Um, the thing that I really want you all to take away from this sort of summary of results is that the US is actually deporting their healthiest populations. Um, and I'll talk more about this later, but the other thing to note is that 50% of our sample surveyed in detention centers actually lived in the US for 10 years or longer. And this is not sort of the rhetoric that we would potentially see in the news. So again, um, a non-trivial amount of people who are being deported have, have made their lives here. Okay, finally, the last thing I'm gonna talk about um, is going to be the healthy migrant hypothesis. So we've talked a little bit about salmon bias that when immigrants become unhealthy, they go back to Mexico. Now we're gonna talk about um, healthy migrant. So I think this one's a little more straightforward to think about and for me, this makes the most intuitive amount of sense. This hypothesis argues that immigrants are likely to be in better health than non-immigrants, so people who remain in their country of origin. And there are a lot of explanations for why this could be the case, right? Um, if you are undocumented, for instance, there are a lot of really intense physical requirements to cross into the United States, right? Um, I have this, this picture here of migrants crossing the Sonoran Desert. And as somebody who's lived in Tucson, I could share some personal stories about how difficult it is just to run um, in the desert in the summer, um, even when you have fancy equipment on. Um, so immigrants could be in better health because health, you know, you, you need to be in some baseline level of health to actually make the journey to the US, or it could be simply because health is related to a bunch of other stuff um, that ultimately result in migration. So this can be the fact that people who are working age tend to be healthier, or people who come to the US to work tend to be healthier. So, so it could be a bunch of different stuff going on that's all related to each other. So if this healthy migrant hypothesis was responsible for this Hispanic health advantage, we should see better overall health amongst immigrants than people who stay in uh, Mexico, for instance. 
And we also should see that health is going to increase the likelihood of migration into the US. So uh, we use two large data sets, my co-authors and I. One is a survey given to uh, Mexican residents. It's the Mexican Family Life Survey. And the other survey captures immigrants right as they enter the US at the Tijuana border. So um, I'm happy to talk more about these data during the Q&A. Um, we use very similar health measures as we have before, so self-reported health, as well as indicators of um, health limitations, chronic conditions, all of that. So what we do is we just compare three populations. We compare non-migrants or Mexican residents who remain in Mexico. We compare U.S. migrants who are Mexican origin but are crossing into the U.S. And we were really interested in understanding um, people who move within Mexico or internal migrants just as a point of comparison. So overall, migrants are likely to be in much better health than people who stay in Mexico. This is the case for those coming to the US as well as those who move within their country of origin. And one of the things I think is really compelling here is that those immigrants who are coming to the US are more likely to have especially low and high levels of education. And you know, somewhat concerningly, fewer than 40% of those coming to the US um, have health insurance. All right. So here are a set of results um, when we are essentially predicting the likelihood of being in good health depending on one's status as a migrant heading to the US, a migrant who is moving within Mexico, and those who remain um, within Mexico. And so what this shows you, um, this Mexican flag overlaps with one, which shows that stayers or non-migrants are going to be our point of comparison. Any estimate that's greater than one here indicates that migrants are in fact in better health. And so what this graph shows is after accounting for a variety of background and personal attributes, both internal migrants and those heading to the US um, are much more likely to be in good or better health by about you know, three times. They're three times as likely to be in good health than people who stay behind. And we think that this really provides some really compelling evidence for the healthy migrant hypothesis. So just to wind things down here, we basically find no compelling evidence that family orientation helps explain the unexpectedly good health of the Hispanic immigrant population. We find at best mixed support for salmon bias. Again, this idea that unhealthy migrants are moving back to their country of origin. We find the most compelling support for this idea of the healthy migrant hypothesis. It depends a little bit. The strength of this relationship depends on which measure of health we used. I'm happy to talk more about that as well. One thing I wanna stress as well is that the two scenarios, the healthy migrant hypothesis and salmon bias, they're not mutually exclusive. So we very well could be living in a world where um, you know, moderately unhealthy people or migrants are leaving the US and crossing into Mexico. And we can have a scenario occurring at the same time where deported people who are the most healthy are going back to Mexico. And to add another layer, 
we could see really healthy people leaving Mexico for the US. So all of this is to say, all of these processes could probably be going on at the same time. And I actually suspect that this is exactly what's happening. And that's why I'm really excited to continue to do some of this work and explore how these things and patterns change over time alongside um, immigration policy. Okay, so just a couple of concluding thoughts, um, next steps, all of that. So I think, you know, if I think about the implications, the sort of so what of my work, I think, as I mentioned before, the thing to really stress is that the US is in fact deporting the healthiest immigrants. And I'm in the early stages of examining the occupation histories of deported migrants, but I'm really suspecting that this pattern is emerging because of the rise of workplace raids that target those who are able to help, that are able to work and who are healthy. And so, you know, if as a whole, we care about things like national productivity, if we care about things like job vacancies and the prices of goods, you know, this is something that employers and policymakers should really pay attention to. Um, it's also worth noting that the most recent recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in economics, uh, David Card, he finds that immigrants are largely in competition with each other for jobs. And so deportation is not really directly benefiting US workers as well. Another issue to think about that I didn't touch on extensively is child outcomes. So even though immigrant parents are healthy, this advantage declines the longer that they live in the US. And this health advantage does not get passed down to their children either. Um, you know, children of immigrants exhibit poor health than both their parents and other US born children. So this begs um, sort of a serious question of why and what can we do? So we suspect, and there's a lot of literature that suspects that this is, can partially be explained by low rates of health insurance and medical services um, accessed by the Hispanic population. Another explanation that I think we need to pay attention to is the fact that many Hispanic immigrants are pretty advantaged before they leave home. But when they arrive to the US, they suddenly have this shock of social standing, right? Um, they suddenly have really low levels of income and education compared to the US born population or the US as a whole. And so there's some work that suggests changes not only in your absolute, but relative social standing matter a lot for physical and mental health. And I think, you know, one potential solution to really um, tackle this issue would be to establish health programs targeted towards infants and children. I think the last thing I'll briefly mention is, you know, we have, you know, it, the discussion of current barriers to legal status and pathways to citizenship, right? Like this is a pretty controversial topic but most people seem to agree that undocumented youth who were brought to the US as children um, should be granted some type of protections, um, especially those young people who are highly educated. And so if we think about programs like DACA and the extent to which they can contribute to overall productivity, um, the country as a whole is likely to benefit. So I will um, end here and I'm happy to provide any elaborations or clarification points. Uh, I, I, in my earlier years when I was doing uh, working as a pediatrician at Children's Memorial in Chicago, which has a large Hispanic population, um, nutrition evaluation clinic was primarily overweight kids and underweight kids. And we saw a lot of Hispanic 
children who've been brought up in the United States by parents who had come from Mexico and they, they, they thought that being heavier was a, a status sign, a sign of being more affluent. And so one of our biggest problems in getting them to do diets and exercise, whatever, was just this feeling that they were proud when they would go home to Mexico to visit. I mean, this was the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, that their children were so healthy because they can. And so that's and, and when you're overweight, there's all kinds of other health problems that follow from that. So um, that's a, a one other issue that that contributes to the worst um, health outcomes amongst uh, uh, I guess you're, uh, amongst children raised in the United States by parents who came here from Mexico because it, it was almost impossible to get them mm -hmm. to understand that their children were not healthy. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, you know, it's certainly true that, as I mentioned, Hispanic immigrants themselves, when they first come to the US, their diet is incredibly rich in fruits and vegetables. The longer they stay here, though, their diet trends, their diet really trends toward processed foods, towards yeah. fast food. And then th that's pretty much becomes a lot of the diet staples of, of these children. And you're absolutely right that there is this confounding of being overweight and good health, particularly among those Hispanics who came here in like the 70s and 80s when it was actually pretty hard and expensive to get a piece of like meat in Mexico. And so it was very common for folks to be pretty underweight um, within many small towns and villages during this period. And um, that's, that's kind of changing with issues of globalization access to fatty fast food. So yeah, I really appreciate uh, that comment. We have other questions. Jenny, Leslie, Dr. Diaz, your uh, work is just spectacular. Thank you so much for um, for this uh, life um, commitment you've made to this really amazing field in sociology. Um, I'm coming at this from an OBGYN physician's perspective. Um, I do underserved care and, and teaching in my in my path, um, and particularly have seen that for our Latino birth outcomes in the U.S. There. Um, and I, we didn't even get into that data today, but I'm fascinated that the outcomes tend to be quite good nationally. Um, we see that in the first generation of births and then in pockets around the country, we see those healthy birth outcomes persist into the next generation, but they're just pockets. And I wondered if when you look at regional data for the large perspective that you have in this work, uh, much greater than, than my small perspective, but in that large perspective, are there um, uh, pockets of communities around the country where children in the Latino community tend to actually have have good health outcomes because we are seeing some communities where the birth outcome data shows that it persists into the second generation like rural North Carolina we saw this um, still had some pockets of really good healthy birth outcomes in that second generation but I don't know if it's true for the the children's health. Thank you for that. Um, this is a really fascinating point. And I um, have looked at some birth weight data, but not regionally. So, so I really don't want to speculate. The one thing I can say is that there is some work that suggests that um, the ethnic sort of enclave might actually offer some protective effects and favorable outcomes like child outcomes, um, better birth weights, um, you know, maternal outcomes as well. Um, if there are sort of not only a large um, number of co-ethnics, but also co-ethnics who are engaged in sort of um, 
local community programs who, who are also sort of um, able to provide that care in, in a medical setting as well. So I think to the extent that there are regional differences, which I'm sure there are. I think a lot of it has to do with the targeting of also like specific programs and providers who um, are able to access this population. But um, I would love to have uh, just to know a little bit more about the regional differences that you're seeing right now. Julie, thank you. Ask your question. Pardon? Oh, Julie has a question. Okay. Let's let uh, we're running out of time is my problem. But Julie, ask your question. Oh, okay. Sorry, I we are out of time. But I saw it seems to me you know we have this whole immigration debate going on right now. But using your data, if I can just summarize and what I took away, you can tell me if this is right or wrong. But first of all, not your data, but other data says that immigrants are not competing with U.S. citizens for jobs. They're competing. With each other. So that's one point. They aren't taking away US citizens' jobs. Secondly, immigrants add to our economy uh, because they do jobs. That's an assumption from what you, the other point that American citizens don't want. But once we have immigration here, we need to do more about the health of our new immigrants, particularly making sure they have access to health and their children have sufficient nutrition and so forth. Is that what you see or what other policy implications? I think so. And this, you know, um, these policy implications become really tricky, right? Like I, these are the conclusions that I draw on based on my data, but we also have this larger issue where we have, you know, US citizens who are also suffering from health declines and, and who really need targeted programs as well to ensure their well being. And so I think, you know, the overall picture is that you know, the US as a whole, um, it would benefit everyone if we were just a little more mindful about um, readily accessible and affordable care, at, at least for those very critical early years for, for those infants and children. So I think that's absolutely right. Very good. I'm so happy that uh, I got to hear your talk. Dr. Diaz, um, this is all new information for me and I'm sure for many of us, and we really appreciate you sharing it with us today. Thank you so much for coming and please call me Christina. Um, okay. But yeah, Christina. I'm, happy, I'm happy to <laughs> answer any other questions via email or um, any other medium, but I really appreciate, um, it was a pleasure sharing some of this work with you all. Well, 